Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. And sometimes it gets a little much, you know, yeah. since I have to deal with my mom. And this week she was, she was frustrating. <laughs> well, it's hard to care, give, care for someone anyway, especially if they're your parent. So tell, you've got to tell me, if you, have you played any music for her, like the Alive Inside film? I did. I didn't do the film, but they inspired me to um, try again with music. Mm -hmm. She was, this is hysterical. She was definitely a talk radio kind of gal. She was a housewife. She raised me and my sister. So when she was doing household chores, she would turn the TV on in the bedroom to a talk show and the one on the family room so that as she went about her day, she could pretty much keep up with what the shows were talking about. But she yeah. also liked to talk radio. And I laugh because I listen to podcasts all the time. <laughs> yep. And I could not think of music that I knew she would connect with. And after talking to the guy from Alive Inside, I thought, okay, let me try again. And so, and then I had also talked to another guest who said it, it took her like a hundred songs to find like 12 her mom connected with. And I was like, mm. oh, that's the problem. I, ha I haven't even gotten close to a hundred songs. So I, I thought about music I remembered as a kid. And some of it was like Nat King Cole, which I associated with my grandmother. There was, I got a few songs and it, it seemed to resonate. Do you remember any of the, the, like the talk daytime TV shows she used to listen to? I'm sure you can find YouTube of all of them and put I them on. I could if I think long and hard. I mean, there was like Good Morning America. They're still around. Oh, but yeah, you'd you want lie. the voices like from then, right? I might have to do a Google search. I never thought about old shows. Because when you were, you're talking about singers, and I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if she might resonate with the voice. Like if she heard Tony Bennett singing. He's been singing for a long time. I wonder if she'd recognize his voice enough to unlock something. Could be. What I did with, I remember Nat King Cole, Lazy Hazy, Crazy Days of Summer. So yeah. I played that one for her and I got up and danced. And so she danced, which was really kind of fun. Yeah. Um, she seems to connect better if, I connect with it. It's like she's mirroring what I'm doing. Now, she and I can't carry a tune at all. So it's not like we're going to sing along because <laughs> I was looking at, um, I just went on iTunes to mood music. And it was, it was like every time I clicked on a different link, it just opened this other door. I mean, it's like, there's like a zillion songs just for, like mood enhancement, like what oh, we're yeah. going to eventually talk about here. <laughs> oh, well, anything could be, you know, mood enhancement. Any, anything at all, any music at all. Even um, look up binaural beats sometime when you have nothing but time. They're incredible. And their sound and their rhythm, I mean, like crickets chirping, a bunch of crickets chirping is a binaural beat. But um, there's so many people out there selling healing music CDs. And it's like, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> really? I mean, I respect that musicians need to make a buck. I'm a musician. I like getting my 20 cent check from Amazon or whatever. It comes. I just, you know, every two years, they'll send me a check for 20. But, uh, you know, so I, I enjoy that. But I would rather that people just learn to use all music as a, a, a mood altering or a physical altering or a mental altering, spiritual altering vehicle. Because any music can do it for you. Why? I mean, why do I need to be the one that tells you to listen to my stuff? The guy next door might have better stuff, <laughs> you know? Well, it's like and my husband likes certain things. He like he likes the rain sounds, and I don't mind them. I mean, I like them, but I can't listen to them for very long because it's like, okay, I've listened to water sounds for yeah. 30 minutes. Now I got to pee. Yeah. It's not relaxing to have to get up and go to the bathroom. <laughs> what about those industrial sounds like the whoa? It's really low kind of rumbling. Um, well, what I was listening to, because a lot of them have rain or ocean oh, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, okay, these are all water. So that, But I found some that were like forest. Forest, yeah, forest. on a foggy day. I'm like, okay, fog does not have sound that I'm aware of. There's some it does change stuff. the sound. Like blacksmith shop kind of sounds where there's clanging, but not obtrusive, but just sort of that's the beat in the back. Ding. Ding, ding, that could be interesting. It, it is interesting. That. Yeah, yeah, just like go out there and everybody's done every kind of thing. I can't imagine something that doesn't exist right now. That's true. <laughs> I find, and I've, I've had to apologize, some of my favorite podcasters, 
I find listening to the spoken voice. I I pop in my earbuds at night, put my head on the pillow, and five minutes I'm asleep. Yeah, you're just gone. Yeah. But if I just put my head on the pillow, it's like my brain just keeps spinning, thinking about what I got to do tomorrow. What you know, mom, and just like it's like, shut yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the only time the voices in my head stop is when I'm making music. I can. I even listening to it won't stop the voices in my head. But when I'm fully present at the piano or something, that's when the that's when it's full. It's all me. It's not the narrator anymore. That's interesting. Well, because yeah. I do portraits and I do this, and then like I said, I've come back from the podcast conference with all these other ideas. Be a little bit more highly produced. I was told my husband before he he left. He he's a real estate broker and he's working from home right now, which is kind of annoying. But <laughs> uh, I said for I did an interview with a gal before the conference on younger on or early onset Alzheimer's. Her dad mm -hmm. was a set dresser for Grey's Anatomy. Wow! And his colleagues and coworkers noticed a problem. But he couldn't have Alzheimer's. He was too young and good looking. That was actually what a doctor told him. Yeah. And yeah. because he was young and because he was good looking and, you know, just he didn't look like a person that had a problem. It, was, it made getting diagnosed even harder. And we yeah. don't really associate Alzheimer's with younger people, although there is a huge segment of the population, well, huge segment of the Alzheimer's population that is under 65. My mom got it before she was 65. <laughs> well, we all worry about losing our memory. And I, there are words that escape me sometimes for a few minutes before I can come up with the word I want. But I think that's normal in some yeah. ways. Yeah, that yeah. one's normal. It's if you just... have memory loss that affects daily life, yeah. like you have to use a lot more reminders, post-it notes, the reminder function on your phone, taking a lot more notes to remember what you said to somebody. That's a problem. That's well, I've kind of always done that just because it's good business practice. So, um, it, but that's, that's something. And, you know, it, <laughs> stuff's out there. You never know when, you know, what day is like the, like the fires. They, they bring you back home real quick. Yeah. Make you conscious of what matters. That's the, that's the one thing with my mom. It's like sometimes I just get so like, frustrated for her because she's got yeah. plenty of money. She should be traveling and doing stuff with the grandkids, you know, and it's just when it, it, when it hits me that it's like, you should not be worrying about all these other residents here and are they okay? And whatever you need. And she gets very um, like complacent, not complacent, compliant with them. Right. Right. And very like a helper type person. And I'm like, I mean, you should be doing what you want, not this stuff. So that, that's when it gets really hard. Yeah. And I, I try to, it took me a while to share a lot of photos and videos of my mom because I kind of felt that it was disrespectful, but I have run into so many people that are like, well, I'm just going to keep mom home forever. And it's like, huh, good no. luck with that. That's not a realistic thing. You keep her at home as long as you can, but you need to understand what is, what you're going to have to do, the help you're going to have to bring in. To, to do that. And it gets to the point where it's not even, it's not cost effective to keep them at home. Yeah, and it's a, so yeah. we started talking about music and oh, how, it he, um, how it can help your mood and relieve stress and relieve pain. The, the one thing that I, I always wanted to say, especially when it has to deal with memory. So memory is that higher cognitive functions, the part of your brain, you know, that, that lives uh, where human beings live. But there's a part of our brain that responds to music. And this is, I think, why Alive Inside is so powerful. The part of our brain that responds to music is really basic. It's the lizard brain. It's the amygdala. And, the, and it's even more than that, it's the rest of us, like our heart, uh, the vagus nerve, the stuff that the, the autonomic nervous system, you know, that makes us go. And that's where music really works. So when I'm in, the, in a place where I'm dealing with someone who's, memory impaired or his brain damaged. And TBI is another example of this. There's, there's cognitive function that's impaired. We can still get at the part of you that responds um, on, on a basic level. And this is something we share with animals. I mean, all of us, any, I think, gosh, anything with a brain probably has an amygdala. I, I should do some research on that to find out <laughs> how far it goes. But you know, even at a cellular level, level, we respond, we vibrate. 
But if, you're, if you know you're working with the amygdala, when you bring in music, then you can create a very interesting uh, sort of conversational connection with someone, provided that you're able to notice the, how they're responding to the music. And you're doing this with your mom, like trying different songs. So as you notice that, when you see one where the lights come on, and that could be just a change in, in the way that her mouth looks or her eyes might widen. I mean, subtle things that she really doesn't have any cognitive control over, but you can observe. Uh, then you'll know you've got a piece of music that's had an effect. What the effect is, anybody's guess. She won't be able to tell you. But if it's something that is frightening, obviously you can, you can tell somebody who's frightened is going to curl up you know, or they're going to they're become alert. And, and you can tell their heart rate increases, stuff like that, or anger, the same kind of thing. Sadness is always a good one. If you, if you hit the sad note and tears come, you'll know that she's had a connection to that, just like you'd know if she was frightened or scared. And then of joy, of course, is the one that is so great and alive inside because all the people that are there are lighting up with joy to the music that they're listening to. But that's all amygdala, amygdala stuff. It's all lizard brain stuff. And you can go and play in that space without too much fear of having it misinterpreted because the nice thing about dementia and Alzheimer's is you don't have to worry about the cognitive level. You can get right to the feeling, level, right to the emotion level and, and play there. And that's a wonderful place to play it, it's frustrating because we don't have a communication language for that. It's all based on your own ability to, to, to observe what's happening with someone who's listening. But you can try this at home. Uh, this is a great game. And I don't know if your husband would be willing to play this, but you can play it. And you can do this either with drums, like hand drums if you have them. Or you can do them with a piece of music and just sort of play drop the needle. <laughs> and try to use music that you haven't heard before and you know the other person has heard before just to see what the two of you will, will do together when the music hits. Will that, be, will that have a, the same kind of emotional response on you? Will it be different? How will it be different? And, and as you talk about that and suss out how you both responded to this new kind of music, a couple of things are happening. First of all, uh, you're, you're understanding non-binary communication <laughs> because there's no right or wrong to emotions. And then secondly, that music is bringing you together. And it's easier to do that with somebody who can think about it and express. But sure. it also works when I'm on stage and I can't talk to anybody in the audience. It also works. It's a, it's a fantastic game and it works for them too because they'll feel that connection coming back. I believe that. And one of the challenges that I notice in the memory residence is it can be kind of loud. Yeah. Not when she's in her room, although the next, her, they have, um, Rooms that are adjoined by a Jack and Jill bathroom. And her next door neighbor must have hearing loss too because TV is always really loud. Yeah. I bet you my mom tunes most of it out, but there's always music playing in the common areas, although I'm not sure they've got the right genre because I think it's yeah. like big band music. And that's prior to my mom's, you know, her time frame for music loving. So it's, I'm getting the idea of like taking some of the more nature mood songs and I actually yeah. just ex experimenting around with myself. There was a, a playlist on iTunes that was, was a specific sleep mood playlist and mm -hmm. it, it had like hip hop roots and I'm not a real big hip hop person. So I thought, well, okay, what does that sound like? Cause I'm like, that to me sounds like polar opposites here and you could, if you thought about it and you were familiar with the different genres of music, you could kind of hear the, it was more of an echo of hip hop. Whenever we're in nature observing children, which still sounds creepy. <laughs> um, I noticed no, and it's very, very subtle. I am probably, maybe it's in my own head, but there just seems to be just this tiny little bit brighter light in mom. And a lot of mm. times when we go back, she'll express very deep appreciation that she had a nice day. Sometimes she actually tells me she loves me and regular listeners know that she thinks I'm her best friend. So telling me she loves me is a little bit weird as a friend. That's not how our family would roll. Yeah. Um, I don't remember her ever telling her friends that she loved them, maybe occasionally, but not in general. So I'm thinking because we're close to two, um, not community parks, there's a ton of community parks, but the um, regional parks, then I could take her and just, she likes to look at the sky and the trees. And maybe if I play the more nature sound music, it might be interesting to see 
how she responds. It's, you know, it's just an experiment. And yeah. there's no wrong when it comes to music. I, I know I've said this before, but the emotions we get are non-binary. We can experience so many of them at the same time. And as long as we remove the judgment from them and say, oh, it's just fear, it's just anger. Um, let's let that feeling come up and let it flow and then see what happens. Um, that's a wonderful way to approach acceptance when no other, op nothing else exists. I mean, with Alzheimer's right now, we kind of have to accept that it's happening and we have to accept the people who, who are dealing with it and then try to invent ways to relate to them and to let them know they're not all alone in this, you know, crazy, noisy, sometimes non-caring world that we all live in. Uh, it's it's great to be able to be that facilitator. I know it's also demanding and crazy and there, you know, sometimes you don't sleep for a week, but you also have this great experience that many of the other of us don't have of being able to be with a loved one as they are in this very interesting process of like maybe discovering new parts of themselves that only they will ever know. Uh, maybe the biggest gift that those of us who don't have to deal with a memory issue can offer those who do. I know that works from the piano. I mean, playing for people in a room, uh, at the, like playing at the symphony, there's going to be people falling asleep and there's people tapping their feet, people looking at their phones and people who are engaged in the music. There's all kinds of people. And maybe the people who are falling asleep are getting the best rest they've ever had. You know, symphonic music has been known to do that. Maybe people looking at their phone just got an idea that they wouldn't have had without hearing Mozart or Beethoven or whatever it is. And maybe people are tapping their feet or remembering a time long ago where they're, they danced with their parents or something to, to a particular tune that the symphony is playing right now. It's just impossible to know, but it's, it's always possible to facilitate. And as... As, as unsatisfying as that is to sit on the, at the piano playing a quiet piece of music while people are unwrapping crinkly paper candy, <laughs> you know, it's, it goes beyond that. I, well, and, when my dad was on hospice, I would leave my house, pick up his mom and drive to their house. And from my house to my grandmother's, I, I never, the whole time he was on hospice, I stopped listening to music in my car is I did not want the feelings associated with his eventual demise and dealing sure, with yeah. her and just all of the twisted emotions that were going on. Yeah. I did not want them reflected back in any of my favorite music. Oh, I get that. When, my, when he, he died on a Thursday night, and I remember for three days... I didn't make a decision. I just told my husband, I am hungry. Go find, go make me food. And he'd say, well, what do you want? I'm like, go find something. I'm not yeah. making any more decisions. But I remember standing in the closet looking at clothes and he's like, you know what? He could tell that that was different. And I, he said, well, what's the problem? And I said, I don't want to pick out an outfit that I really like. That's going to then be associated with these negative emotions. Yeah. And I, I still listen to music, but I, I have changed kind of what I listen to from then because I don't really need the triggers because I still got to deal with my mom. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's been really hard with her is processing his death while dealing with the emotions of her situation. It's just, I mean, that's a constant grief. Yeah. There's no, um, there's no respite. Mm -mm. Let's talk about music and caregiving because that's somewhere um, that I can go a little bit. But what you're talking about is so important for us uh, as human beings, and that's how do we deal with the negative emotions. And, and I, I, I respect what you're saying about not wanting to associate stuff that was good with anything that's currently bad, um, and, and there's a way through that. So like you, I've felt music very deeply all my life, and I have at least a handful of songs probably more than that, but I can think of several right now, just off the top of my head, that have been there for me at times where they not only offered me a lifeline, but years later then also um, bothered me immensely. Same song, just the place I was at in life. Um, it, it's, it can be really annoying. <laughs> and in, in many cases, it can be... Um, mentally frustrating to have that music in your face triggering things that you didn't want triggered 
So um, I've developed a practice for that because I've, I've discovered that it's been something that's been typical of me all my life. I bring big, big emotion to the piano. I'm able to get the deep emotion out of the music that I want and it's an effective performance. And that's great, except that deep emotional part, you know, every, you have to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And I went all the way to suicide on those deep emotions, the, the really depressing, sad ones. And I still am basically a depressed person but I've learned to have a practice to let that depression come up and be fully experienced and let it go in safety with no side effects by, by coming to music in a way that is full, full presence. We were talking about how the voices in my head are quiet when I'm playing the piano. There's a time I didn't have the piano. And on that evening, all I could do was get out my flat screen and play this piece of music that I had to listen to. And I just, I'd had to hear it and it saved my life. It, it literally, the process of letting those emotions come up and be fully, fully expressed um, without a need to act on them was cathartic for me. And I've noticed since then, so many ways looking back at my life, that's been an important part of my self-care, of my behavioral self-care and emotional self-care. I was doing a therapy session. I was, trauma, I was in trauma therapy and my, and my therapist was giving me EMDR, which is wonderful. So eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. The eyes move left and right, or you tap on your shoulders or whatever. I was listening to music, and it was moving from my left ear to my right ear and back and forth. And this creates a, a bilateral stimulation across your, um, what's it called, corpus callosum between the left and right hemispheres of the brain. It turns out when that's happening, you can release negative emotion. Hmm. I'm like, so I'm listening, and my therapist is, is watching me through this process, and all of a sudden I stopped, and my jaw hit the floor because... Guess what I've been doing at the piano all my life? Bilateral stimulation, left and right, left and right, left and right. That's and that, when you bring big emotion to left and right, bilateral stim, the negative charge on the emotion disappears and leaves you with the power that is in the emotion, but without the negative charge. And I, 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 my jaw dropped and I said, do you know what I've been doing here? I told my therapist all my life at the piano and her jaw dropped. Now we call it EMDR, but musicians who do this are experiencing such a sense of relief from our intention to plumb the depths of these deep emotions. What are their anger, fear, sadness, even joy to go that deep to make the performance work? That's hard work. And if you don't have a way of minding yourself, those emotions can overwhelm you. So what I'm suggesting is that music as a tool for allowing those overwhelming emotions to come up is your way forward instead of the block. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, one more story on this, and, and, and then we can talk a bit more, but it's just hitting me so strongly right now. Is that I've seen my dad cry twice in my life. And one of those times was at a concert I was giving, and I happened to have this medley of love songs from the 40s and 50s from musicals. And um, one of them was Till There Was You. It's the Beatles have covered. I think it's from uh, the, the Music Man. And I remember as a child that my parents would sing the, it's like a desk hint. It's one of those two-part things where the guy sings something and the woman sings something and they all blend together perfectly. And that remember riding in the car as an infant and them singing the song Till There Was You and, um, and other songs, Music Man as well. So I was playing this song as part of this medley and I finished and I bowed and I looked over and my dad was in tears. And I had no idea that, first of all, he was capable of feeling that deeply. And secondly, that it would be over something so innocent. You know, something about that song just grabbed him that night. And it, it, it's going to stay with me, you know, for the rest of my life because it was such an important thing for me to see my father to have, have that kind of depth in his emotions. That's, that's beautiful. I can visualize it because that's how I, that's how I roll. Um, just have started my journey on the audio end of the creative spectrum but going back to so you you let the song bring up emotions maybe you're just feeling frustrated and you want to strangle your your parent or your spouse because you know like my mom was snapping at me and treating me like I was some naughty kid which you know it's that's a difficult dynamic to start with with role reversal when you're caregiving for your parent yeah yeah so I'm thinking okay so I let the I get in the car, I play something that brings up that emotion. And now, so now how I've let it out. Now, how do I let it go? Oh, well, this is the, this is the, the key question, isn't it? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> so 
you know how when, you're, when you cry, sometimes you just can't stop, but eventually you have to because you're just all cried out? That's how you know. You don't stop until it's over. Our, our, our brains, whatever, our, our systems remember music, and we can use that. We can leverage that, especially when we're dealing with, with the emotions that we don't necessarily want. We can leverage that with a silver bullet playlist to take us through the whole ride, which happens like that. You don't have to hear the whole thing. It'll be enough that your body recognizes it. So you were talking about your silver bullet playlist. Yeah. So if you were like with me, okay, we got, let's see, four songs. We'll start yeah, with, if I kept them slightly short, no, it's about 15 minutes from moms yeah. to home. Yeah, so about three, 15. So what type of songs should I look for? And I know this is more, it's like a personal, it's kind of like saying what kind of shoes should I buy? What kind of songs would I look for to help kind of just help me release the frustration? So the, the music that's most powerful for you, it, the, the Jennifer Power music is different than the Bill Power music. So what you do is out of the, I don't know, your top 40 songs or something, pick four of them that are most closely related to frustrating for you, whatever those might be. Now, a lot of people don't have songs for emotions that we think are, quote, negative. But if you think about it for a little bit, you can find some songs that are frustrating. You know, songs that, are, that make you, make you they're, they're difficult for, for you to listen to. They make your skin crawl a little bit. They get you slightly uncomfortable. So when you found four of them, um, the first one in the list is one that sort of introduces that feeling. Now, you're, if you're going to the Silver Bullet playlist, you're already feeling frustrated. So you want a song that invites that frustration, that does nothing to block it, that just says, okay, we're going to be frustrated now. The second song on your list is going to take you further into frustration. So maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's something by Metallica, whatever. You know, I actually like, have a song in mind because I've hated it my entire life, and it's, it's a popular song from the early 80s, late 70s. You're So Vain, hate There you go. Song. Perfect. Okay. That song irritates the crap out of me. <laughs> but, it's only, but it's only the second one. So the, the climax... Of the frustrate of the silver bullet playlist, that's the most powerful song in the playlist. So that that number three song has got to be the one that takes you over the edge, whatever that edge is. If it's frustration, if it's anger, if it's fear, if it's sadness, whatever, that's the one that takes you over the edge. So maybe your Sylvain goes at the top, and then on the way down, you want something that gives you sort of a soft landing. So it's still frustrating. You still want a frustration in there, but you want to be like, oh, okay, I'm frustrated and it's going to be all right. I'm okay with it. I'll fix it later. You know, there's a lot of songs out there that are unrequited love kind of songs, and unrequited love does great for frustration. So you've got a big selection of things to choose from, from lots of different genres. They're all out there. Um, Hip-hop is great for frustrating music. Like, the, not, not gangster rap, but something that's got a little bit of a ride to it. Um, check out Lizzo. She's got some amazing stuff out there right now. And, and then, so you get to the end of that, and your, your fourth song is the one that just, you know, that's when you, you get home, you turn off the engine, and you walk into the house. Now, if, if, if the songs have worked, you'll find yourself at the end of them in a more neutral place. That so, sounds very doable. It, it's I'm doable. going to give that a try, and then I'll share my little playlist on my social media. And Oh, yeah, please do. I share mine on Spotify, so um, I, I've got some for just about everything. <laughs> Well, I'm almost thinking for somebody that's in the early stages of memory loss might want to do these silver bullet playlists mm. because that I would think when you've progressed to a state where my mom is, where, you know, she can't tell you what her last name is, much less what songs she likes. And I'm not sure there would be a lot of experimentation to do a silver bullet playlist for her to, to choose the songs for her now. That would be yes. a lot of work. It'd be tough because it does involve the thinking. Right. So if you had these playlists in the early stages, I would think somebody could play them for you. Like if my mom gets agitated, like she was agitated for because I couldn't understand her on Monday. And you could be like, okay, we're getting into the agitated part of the day. And then you could whip out the playlist. And it is better to put headphones on people with memory loss because it's, it helps block out all the extraneous noise. You know, I would think you could be like, okay, mom's, or she seems really sad. So maybe we can have like the uplifting playlist. 
So there's sure. definitely a benefit. You've, you've inspired me because I hadn't thought of it as a tool where if you put all your silver bullet playlists together for your normal, you know, 12 moods or whatever that are important to you and had them somehow on a chart and could still communicate with your family, like somehow which music you want. I mean, maybe it's a visual thing. Do Alzheimer's patients still recognize facial effect, like happy, so. sad? So maybe pointing to the happy, pointing to the sad, and then hearing that music would help process whatever that moment feels like for, a, for an Alzheimer's patient. That, I think, is brilliant. I would love to see that in play. That's yeah. a great idea. <laughs> well, there we go. Now we have another, another yeah, thing we can do. <laughs> so let me ask a question because oh. you were talking about facial expressions, and I watched this video this morning, a little quick video, when somebody living with Alzheimer's can't communicate, we have to learn to interpret facial expressions. And this video was of a gentleman who was in the very early stages, just recently diagnosed. So he was saying, you know, when I get to this point, he had play acted a routine where the staff thought he was frustrated, but he's actually in pain. Mm. So how can music help alleviate pain? Because we do have a lot of people with chronic pain and we obviously have a huge problem with you know, opioid addiction that yeah. stems from pain, you know, doctors you know, we were, think they're helping and now they've caused another problem. <laughs> the, the whole um, medication thing is just, it's a nightmare. I don't understand how one doctor working on your left ear can medicate you for something and the doctors working on your right shoulder doesn't see that that medication that the ear guy gave you is going to interfere with what he's given you. And I, I don't understand how to make that work, but um the whole thing about pain. So uh, the studies on music and pain indicate that people who are listening to music need half the pain medication as people who don't. Interesting. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, that's that's a difference in a lot of... Well, <laughs> that's, when you think of huge. somebody that maybe you could take ibuprofen instead of an opioid. Not sure. Yeah. yeah. Ibuprofen is half of an opioid, but even if you take... Not yeah, addictive. I, I'm much more holistic, so I try... I broke my collarbone three years ago by flying off my bicycle and I build up tolerances to medications really quick. So I knew that it was like, you know, the neighbor who's had every kind of issue, she was like, you're going to take both pills every four hours. Don't let the pain get ahead of you. Da, 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 da. Well, yeah. that didn't last long because the medication made me nauseous. Like I think the third dose, third or fourth dose was over the top all you could do so i cut back but anybody that's taken oh it wasn't an opioid but it was um they, when the pharmacist gives you the stool softener to go with the painkiller you know you're gonna have a problem yeah, that's a problem yeah well after having to re take extra stool softener and i'm really sorry about this visual guys <laughs> i was like I'm done with these because that problem is worse than the pain in my collarbone. Yeah. And I'm, I never thought about using music as a way of relieving that, that pain. It was also frustrating because I couldn't get dressed or I, thankfully it was in the summer so I could work workout pants that had elastic because only one arm worked and try pulling your pants up with one arm. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get a very humble, um, understanding of people with permanent disabilities. Well, there's something even better than deadening the pain. Um, and we're talking, by the way, not about so much chronic pain, although music works great there too, but we're talking about acute pain because the study was done in the hospital in the ICU. And um, one of the things that's important about the ICU is healing. So music also increased the rate of healing. They could watch the levels of pituitary growth hormone, the healing hormone rise in the patients with music. But I don't know about your ICU. I've been in a bunch of them, not as a patient, but as a visitor. And there's no music in the ICUs that I've been in. Why? Because we have this study. Why would you not have some music playing in there? Yeah. So, you know. Well, that kind of ties <laughs> into the research I did earlier. They were talking about playlists for different moods. So like you have your morning playlist to kind of get you going and you have your, your chores playlist, which <laughs> for most of us would last most of the day. You know, then there's playlists for focus and calming and sleeping. And this, I read a lot of different things online. And they talked about 
basically having different playlists for different times of your day. So it's kind of similar to what you're talking about, these indigenous people. Yeah. Are, they're, like they're creating it as they go along, and I'm sure in the morning it's probably more chipper, upbeat, kind of more energetic, and as the day goes on, I'm sure it changes. Man, I'm really like... Got to go find a Nat Geo movie or something to watch on this. Oh, I've, I've got a better really... one. I, I, I was, my curiosity got piqued on this. Do you know who Bella Fleck is? The name sounds kind of familiar. Yeah, it's like a name you know. He's a banjo player, and he's like a virtuoso banjo player. He's, he's if, if you know, the banjo was invented for this guy to play. He's, he's the Yuri Menuhin or whatever of, of the banjo. So he decided, he's American, he decided that he would go to Africa because that's where the banjo came from originally. And that he wanted to play banjo music with people in Africa who were also playing native instruments. And so he was off on this research project and a documentary and all of that. But this documentary, you find out how it changes him to learn how present music is for people in indigenous cultures. So he's, you know, he goes on stage and music is present there, but this is like throughout life. So you can see the change happen in Bella Fleck from the start of the documentary to the end, where the culture of all day music just works on him and softens him and he becomes this amazing human being at the end of the movie where he was amazing at the beginning but all of a sudden he's become like part of the whole thing and all of the differences even between the instruments disappear and you hear him making music on his banjo that sounds so much different than where he started you know in the oh, course definitely. of whatever like an hour documentary i'm off definitely you? check that out because that sounds really interesting because I know as a creative person, I get like, it's almost a physical feeling when an idea happens or a client is in front of me. And I, I do a lot of high school seniors, mm -hmm. graduation portraits. So they bring me all their stuff. And I love it when all of a sudden it's just like, click, the light bulb goes on and I get the really yeah. great idea or what at least I think is a great idea for a client or since the podcast conference which was not geared necessarily towards us little indie podcast people. It was, there was some talks that were very industry focused and it was like, wow, this is like way beyond my pay grade. I'm not even sure this is in the same building as my pay grade, but that's okay. And it's, I would listen cause I'm like, well, I'm, I'm here. There's not a whole lot else to do. Downtown LA three blocks over was skid row. So I wasn't yeah. going to go hiking around too much by myself. And all of a sudden it's just like, Oh, light bulb went on. And it's just, I love that feeling. Well, you know how all this research, they're sort of taking a step back now and looking at it from a longer perspective. I think taking a step back from our cerebral cortex and sort of checking in with the amygdala might be a similar um, kind of process. You know, we've, we've, especially guys, you know, we've been told to stuff our feelings for so long. And that's not serving us anymore. And um, that's where it all starts in the amygdala. So if we can get a better grasp on how to let that little guy do what it does and be okay with, with, what it, with the information it's giving us, the emotional information it's giving us, without having to go and act out on it. I mean, you can be plenty angry, and that's a good thing, you know, if you're leading a bunch of troops into battle. But that same anger can come up from day to day, like you're frustrated with your kids or whatever. Um, once you can take the edge off of that energy, the energy still remains just without the negative charge. And you can use that energy to help like guide your kids into doing a better job with their chores or, or, you know, whatever the thing is that that anger got triggered in you. There's, there's nothing wrong with anger. What's wrong is what we do with it. And we've been stuffing it and we've been breaking things and hurting people. And in between those two extremes, <laughs> there's a much healthier place to be. If we could just stand back a little bit, and let the amygdala, amygdala tell us what's going on without judgment. And then work with that energy instead of it being an enemy, being a friend. Uh, I think we've got something. So music lets us do that. It, it's you know, safe. It's not, no side effects. It doesn't suppress anything. And, it, and, and you can very safely be angry. I could, yeah, then, you know, I used to have that? an anger, well, not an angry playlist, but I'd have like certain songs and bands I'd go to when I was just like, Rrr. yeah, yeah, because it kind of helped release some of that, you know, I always yes, call it exactly. screaming head music when my daughter was a teenager. Exactly. Like, yeah. You know. And you then you this. listen to something that's less screamo 
and maybe more, you know, I'm from the 80s, I'm an 80s kid, so more heavy metal. Yeah. And then maybe you kind of segue into something. I can see. I think I've had a silver bullet playlist in the yeah, past. Chances <laughs> are. So I love my job because I just remind people of what they already know. <laughs> Did you see the uh, Parkinson's study? No, is, my this... neighbor has it. So I'm familiar with a lot of, like he used to do, or he might still do boxing because there's a lot of things with boxing that's supposed to help Parkinson's, people with Parkinson's. So the, this is ages ago now. I think it was in the 80s. Um, doctor in LA was working with Parkinson's patients and with, on walking. So it's real, you have to use a walker. It's pretty hard. And there's a rhythm to it that's very difficult to get into the flow. So he decided to put on some music. And I kid you not, the music he used was Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I can see that one. As, you know? well, I mean, he's walking to it in the movie, right? Exactly. And, and without difficulty, I still remember this quote. LA Times, without difficulty, the doctor said, the Parkinson's patients began to walk. And the best part was they asked him why, and he said, we don't know. <laughs> no, but I'm going to try some, I'm going to try some staying alive with mom next week. <laughs> yeah, try some staying alive. So it, it works by entrainment, of course, because all that happens is without thinking about it, the amygdala connects your feet to the beat, right? Well, as part of the research I did prior to us talking was... If you want to be like calm, find music that's about 60 beats per minute because your heart will sync up with the beats. Yes. And I thought that was really interesting. And obviously, if you want to sleep, you need something much slower than 60 beats a minute. Yeah, good ambient music or toning or something like that. So all of the, the science on this and the frequencies and that you can get, you know, it's a deep rabbit hole. And people will tell you that, you know, you need to sink into the frequency of the earth. And, and, and okay, so that's great. Maybe they're right. But here's the, here's the really cool thing. Inside you, there's a little device that knows what you need. And all you have to do, if you don't know it yet, is try out a few different kinds of sounds and rhythms and whatever until it syncs up with that little thing inside of you that says yes. And that's what it is. One thing that I can say that is so important, though, about caregiving, um, what a thankless job. And if there's anything that we can do for our caregivers, it's to show appreciation. Well, you have a fantastic evening and I will make sure that all of your websites and all your social media accounts will all be in the show notes. So you guys <laughs> <Thank> can you. <laughs> find all of Bill's fantastic research and online courses and everything Bill's doing just by clicking through on the show notes. Thank you so much. I love to hear from people. So feel free to reach out whatever. If you're listening, there's lots of ways to reach me, but just drop me a line. Say you're out there. I appreciate you. Well, thank you. And you have a fantastic evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.